the social world of Nottingham's historic green spaces was a collaboration between the universities of Nottingham and Derby, local history and heritage groups, and some independent researchers. The project explored the creation and development of the recreational spaces created by Nottingham's 1845 Enclosure Act. In January 2014, a conference was held at Nottingham Contemporary and members of the project team spoke about aspects of their work. In this talk, Professor John Beckett explains the environmental and social conditions which influenced the debates that led to the Enclosure Act and the resultant green spaces. Um, I'd now like to um, introduce um, Professor John Beckett. Uh, he's currently Professor of English Regional History uh, at Nottingham University, Chair of the Thoriton Society, the Local History and Archaeology Society for Nottinghamshire, and a member of the Castle Working Group looking at future uses of Nottingham Castle. Professor Beckett has published extensively on local and regional history, including Nottingham's 1839 and 1845 Enclosure Acts. And John is going to talk to us this morning about the 1845 Enclosure Act, which was one of the reasons uh, Nottingham still has the parks and green spaces that it has today. So can we please welcome Professor John Beckett. I'll just pull up his... You can use the clicker if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. I thought you'd all gone. We're going to be hearing a, a good deal today about the <clears throat> open spaces around Nottingham. We've heard from Councillor Trimble about the uh, effort that's gone into looking after them in, in, in recent years. And it seemed to me <clears throat> that one of the questions that our project should be asking is how we came by them in the first place. Why does Nottingham have these green spaces, as we call them? Um, why did they arise? What was the background to them? We all know that somehow they're connected to the 1845 Enclosure Act, the General Enclosure Act for Nottingham of 1845, and indeed... June Perry is going to be saying more about that this afternoon or later this morning. <clears throat> but the key issue in some ways is how did we come by them in the first place <clears throat> and what was the point of them? And this is bound up with the, a, a, a huge political debate that was going on in the middle decades of the 19th century about air and the particular phrase that the Victorians liked, green lungs. If you've never heard the phrase green lungs, you haven't read any good, decent Victorian um, <clears throat> books on the subject because the Victorians were obsessed with air quality. And in particular, the miasma theory, whereby disease was spread by foul air. They were quite sure that one of the great problems of their society was the poor quality of air, which meant that... Uh, disease and so forth, was passed on from individual to individual. And the way that they started to work this out in time was to try to make sure that there was sufficient green space for air for people to enjoy recreation. Just as uh, Councillor Trimble has referred to the modern parks as a place of uh, entertainment, recreation and so on, this was the idea in the Victorian period. What made it so uh, awkward for them was that <clears throat> many industrial towns of those who developed in the course of the 19th century had done so without any attention to green space. And there were notorious examples, particularly among some of the Lancashire cotton towns, <clears throat> the extent that there were no green spaces. There was not even any verges. There were no trees. There was just brick upon brick upon brick. And if you can think back, those of you who are old enough, if you can think back to the days of uh, the older houses in Radford and places like that, there were very little evidence of anything green. I was <coughs> brought up in, I was actually brought up in Heysen Green. And uh, <coughs> when you go around the country, people say, that's a lovely name, must be a nice suburb. 
<coughs> go further. Now, where did therefore all of this come from? Well, it came from the 1845 Nottingham Enclosure Act. And the debate which went into the Enclosure Act in the first place was all about trying to decide what was needed for Nottingham. And you'll see, if you, if you want to read this, you're not under any pressure to, there won't be a quiz later to ask you to remember what's in them. Uh, the Act here was setting out the terms and conditions under which space would have to be made available. <clears throat> it's a slightly technical debate about 45 and 50 acres. It's a technical debate about who's going to lay it out and so on. But reference is made lower down to the commons and wastelands called forest, the forest and Mapley Hill. <clears throat> now these are good examples of a Victorian, another Victorian phenomenon, which is that many of the new industrial towns still had commons attached to them. And <clears throat> these commons would become fairly important areas for recreation. I don't know if any of you know Newcastle, but Newcastle has the town Moor, which was a very large area of common and waste, which was available for the use of people to enjoy. In Nottingham, the two spaces that are identified here were, of course, the forest, which had a long heritage of being an open space and of being available for public usage, uh, and the other one was Mapley Hill, that was generally regarded as being too far away from the centre of Nottingham for individuals to go and enjoy the, uh, uh, the ambiance of the area. Now this was uh, a clause in the Enclosure Act, uh, and the following clause, which I'm not going to go into today because we'll hear more about this later as well, the following clause was on the laying out of cemeteries. So that essentially what uh, was being done here was to lay out four recreation grounds, um, or these are the four that, that eventually become the recreation grounds. They're not specified except for the forest in the Act, the, uh, and they're mainly organised afterwards, and four walks, Queen's Walk, Robin Hood Chase, Corporation Oaks, and Elm Avenue. And again, they're not specified in the, in the Act. Um, the, the, the logic was that after the Act had passed, this would become the responsibility of the town council. Uh, and in 1850, a small committee was set up to decide where these should be. Uh, the decisions were taken, and then the land was laid out. By May 1851, we're told that the whole of the pathway in Queen's Walk is finished with gravel. A dry pathway has been formed through Elm Avenue, Corporation Oaks, and Robin Hood Chase. And they will be open to the public on the 18th of May, 1851. So we can work out what has happened after the passing of the Act uh, and the decision-making that went into the creation of these spaces. But why, why did Nottingham have them at all? Why was it necessary to have green spaces as part of the enclosure? That is the green spaces, but as we were dis I was discussing earlier with Jonathan, we might need to improve on that map, uh, which is an excellent hand-drawn map by Jonathan. Uh, the dark bits are the green spaces. Um, don't worry about that for too much. So, why does it all start in this way? Nottingham, in the 17th century, is a small town population roughly 3,000 at the beginning of the 17th century, um, and even with significant growth, population only about 11,000 by 1750, and in Badder and Pete's map, um, which you may be able to follow, there's, there's gardens everywhere. Nottingham was known as a garden town, um, and you can see them all over the place. Uh, virtually everybody had a garden in the 1740s. So, in other words, the town had grown, but it was still uh, a situation in which it was still very pleasant to live in. But the, 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 obvious, the, the evidence was that things would become more difficult. Now, this is uh, just about how the town looked uh, in, by the 1840s. 
You've got the old town in the middle there, which I'll come back to. You've got the, 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 the open fields, the sand field and the clay field. You've got the forest. You've got Mapley Hills up here. And down here, you've got the meadowland. In other words, the town itself was physically limited to the space in the middle. In fact, I can go further and say that the physical space available within the town boundaries uh, gradually is overtaken and is not sufficient for the number of people living in the town. Why? Because of this industry, the hosiery industry, that developed in the course of the 17th going into the 18th century. And the consequence of this is that in 1772, we have a contemporary saying, everything looks fine, the streets are broad and open, uh, gentlemen of great fortune um, <coughs> reside here, which is not to be wondered at, the prospect over the, over the fields is so lovely. But only a few years later, we have a rather different picture cr cropping up. The entire land being scarce, the great increase of inhabitants holding forth the prospect of advantage, closes being taken over, high prices, um, and so forth. You can see what's happening here, that the land around the town was beginning to disappear under houses. And the result of this is that <clears throat> a town of 11,000 in 1750, more than doubled by 1800, doubled again by 1850, and in that process of increasing from 11,000 or so to about 57,000, the footprint of the town increased by only one third. And the consequence of this, fairly simply, was <clears throat> that there wasn't sufficient land in which to build new houses, and so the new houses that were built tended to be of a lower quality from those that already existed. And the reason for this is a straightforward one. <clears throat> the fact was that the open fields were not enclosed and the corporation supported the Burgesses and those who were resisting enclosure. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But that was the fact. Everywhere else, you expect market forces here to work, and they do. So if you look at what happened, I'm not going to do this this morning, but I can explain this in more detail if you'd like to know. If you look at what happened in Leicester, in Lincoln, in Northampton, in Derby, in other words, in all of the county towns of the East Midlands, apart from Nottingham, the opposite occurs. Uh, there is enclosure, uh, land is taken out of agriculture, made available for building and houses, and none of them have the problems that Nottingham ran into. Uh, Leicester was later to be said to be one of the most spacious towns in the country, and never to have had major overcrowding. So <clears throat> Nottingham is quite different in this sense from the towns around it. <coughs> now this was not for want of trying. Uh, my colleague uh, Paul Elliott, who you'll hear from later, uh, wrote an article just a few years ago in the Thoroton Society's Transactions about the efforts made to enclose the town in the 1780s and the resistance that there was at that time. There were later proposals in 1806, in 1813, and again in 1833, but nothing really came to bear. And of course the reasoning for this was that there was a strong interest in the town in retaining the open fields. But the consequence of this... What's in that, Jonathan? It's water. Oh, dear. <laughs> the, Sorry, oh, okay. The consequence of this, you can see from John Blackner's account of the town in 1815. Uh, and the basic argument is that the, the, the only way that Nottingham has been able to expand, to expand its major industries, was to have smaller houses with less facilities in them. Uh, and this is an example written by a contemporary, John Blackner, who lived in the town, uh, about just how poor he thought the quality of the housing was. So we're running in, then into a problem that because the open fields and meadows had not been enclosed, the town has become overbuilt and it's got real problems uh, in terms of its housing. Um, running, the, running the clock further down to the 1800s, 
Health of Towns Commission in 1845, exactly the same sort of language about the, uh, the houses of the worst possible construction and so on. So you might say, well, why continue to build in this way? But of course, part of the reason is that the hosiery industry in particular was primarily a domestic industry and people wanted to live in the town partly because it was traditional. People didn't go to work in the way that we do now, but they also wanted to be able to live close to their work and close to the hosiers who supplied them with yarn and, took, uh, and bought from them uh, their finished goods. For the lace industry and for other parts of, uh, of trading with a little bit more money involved, it was feasible to move out of the town into the suburbs, places like Lenton, New Lenton, Radford, New Radford, um, and indeed uh, places like Hyson Green and Baseford uh, and Carrington there, all of which are growing up outside the town boundaries because they can offer space. And here's a good example of this from, uh, from Radford. Uh, you'll recognise this. This is Ilkeston Road. This is Alfreton Road here. And essentially what's happening is that this, is, this side of Alfreton, the, the, the um, far side of Alfreton Road is um, in Nottingham, and the left side, if you like, is in Radford, and so development takes place in Radford, but not the other side of the road, because that's in the fields. So you're beginning to get this attempt to develop the town beyond uh, the fields because of this pressure on land. Now, why, where does this come from? What has happened here? One of the biggest issues that, that arises at this point is how are you going to um, enclose land, because this is a big issue in the 18th century, as I'm sure many of you are aware, how are you going to enclose land around towns if it's not going to be possible? Uh, you've got to have some sort of green space for people. This is an example from Baseford following the enclosure there in the 1790s of the complaints that were voiced about the fact that there was just nowhere to do anything. There's nothing in the shape of open ground for recreation, the want of which is complained about. You can, I'll leave you to read this yourself, but you'll see further on about you know, how are you going to, to play cricket and other games um, if you've got no space. And this is not an unusual feature. This is, of course, is Baseford. It's an area we know. But other, other areas and places, for example, many of the Lancashire cotton towns, Bolton. Um, Bolton was said in 1833 to be a town of 45,000 people with no public walks or open spaces. And I could quote you other examples as well. By contrast, Nottingham is a beacon of enlightenment. Why? Because surrounding the open fields are green spaces, the meadows, uh, the area uh, of the fields. <clears throat> I quote here, uh, almost every other man is a cricket player. This is a contemporary in the 1840s. And at 5 a.m. on a summer morning, innumerable parties played cricket in the beautiful meadows surrounding the town. And why? Because there is no other town in the kingdom, perhaps, that offers so many advantages in having open spaces in the immediate vicinity of the town. And that's a quote from Manchester. It's not a local quote. And what's happening here is that is, is the converse argument that says you need green space, in other words, that places like Bolton and Blackburn and other Lancashire towns have become overbuilt and there's no green space. By contrast, the argument is Nottingham is a wonderful place. You can go out first thing in the morning, just a few yards into the meadows, set up your stumps and play cricket, as the England team might have uh, benefited. <coughs> Better not go down that route, however. And so we get a, a, an issue arising where you can almost see Nottingham in, uh, back to front here, where it's a good example. But a second issue has arisen by the 1830s, a national issue which was 
You need green lungs. You can't have towns with no spaces like this. Something has got to be done. Well, the way that something was done in the 1830s was for a select committee of the House of Commons uh, to come up with a proposal. And the proposal was that in future, any bill relating to enclosure in any part of the kingdom would have to make provision for green spaces. Now, this is an issue which I, I could talk a lot about and I'm not going to. Just, just take the, the point is that it means that when Nottingham does get round to enclosing in the 1840s, there is a legislative backdrop against which it has to work, and that backdrop is it must have, uh, it must have some green spaces. So eventually, the debate moves on. The debate about whether Nottingham is a good thing because it's easy to get to the green spaces or a bad thing because it's got poor quality housing. How's it resolved? In the 1840s uh, come along two men who are absolutely critical to this debate in Nottingham by the 1840s. The first of them is William Felkin, uh, a name that will be familiar to many of you who interested in the history of Nottingham in the 19th century, lace uh, man, but also a politician, mayor of the town, uh, and one of Nottingham's worthies, really. Um, and what Felkin did was he starts a movement in the 1840s, which is a national movement, to collect statistics. You might think that we have more than enough statistics, and every time you look at the news or you open the newspaper, there's another set but until the 1840s, nobody systematically connected, collected statistics. The, the, one or two things had started out on this in terms of, for example, the decennial census. But it's only in the 1840s that you really begin to get arguments based upon information like this. And Felkin was the man who started this. He started to collect figures and to argue that Nottingham could no longer... Sorry about that could no longer rest upon its laurels because the death rates in the inner town were unacceptably high. The fearful rate of mortality, said um, Felkin, the average of life was much less in Nottingham than the surrounding towns, he argued. At the moment, it was too soon. Nobody was listening. But in 1842, this man, Edwin Chadwick, one of the great figures of 19th century uh, reform, uh, produced a report on you know, one of these wonderfully named Victorian uh, books that you really sort of take the title and think, I want to read that one. He produced his, quote, report on the sanitary condition of the labouring population of Great Britain. Real sort of bedtime reading, isn't it? And... He drew, his atten he drew attention, again using statistics, culled from all over the country, to suggest that urban development in England had failed, failed in particular in terms of the high death rates and the lack of opportunity uh, out in the, the green areas. And the government was stirred into setting up a royal commission in order to look at this further. And that one of the key people was, one of the key witnesses to the Royal Commission was the second, the second of Nottingham's real pioneers at this time, Thomas Hawksley. I think, I think as much as anybody, Hawksley is the great figure in 19th century Nottingham. He left in the 1850s and moved to London and became a national figure in mechanical civil engineering. Um, but he does more than anything. Uh, from the 1820s to create clean water supply and to make life easier in Nottingham. And Chadwick and Hawksley were, if you can be, friend, if you can be mates in the 19th century, they were. There's a, there's a vast correspondence between them uh, in University College Library archives in London. Um, and I've been, in, I've been, let me say, I have been to the archive and I have collected photographs. <laughs> Uh, as you can see here. I haven't actually yet got around to reading them. But you can s begin to see that at this very crucial period in the early 1840s, when the debate in Nottingham is really hotting up, Hawksley is in very regular correspondence with Chadwick. And they are discussing 
huge issues about how you deal <coughs> with the health of poorer people in towns. Now, there's plenty of other um, evidence of this um, being uh, created, but the really key uh, organisation uh, then becomes... Uh, the, oh, sorry, this is, this is Hawksley's evidence. This is part of Hawksley's evidence to the Royal Commission uh, in the 1840s, in which he looks at the quality of housing, or the poor quality of housing, the back-to-backs that have been built, uh, and, and so on. I don't have time to discuss that with you today, but I'm happy to say more about that in, in questions if you'd like to. Um, but the Nottingham Review, which was the more radical of the newspapers in the town at the time, comes up and becomes the sort of supporting mechanism for this process. No one can read Mr. Hawksley's report without being convinced about the appalling sacrifice of health and life in Nottingham. The average duration of life amongst the males of the town is little beyond 20 years. Now, from the, from the autumn of 1844, there is huge pressure to enclose the open fields and to establish, under the terms of the government legislation of the 1830s, to establish green spaces. And in particular, the Nottingham Review picks up this issue. This one is worth just spending a second looking at. What becomes of the long-repeated cry that the open fields were necessary for the health and recreation of the inhabitants? Is it not evidence that these fields and meadows, which can't be improved or built on, etc., are the causes of disease and death of thousands? Now, the review is, at this stage, making it quite clear that it is backing Hawksley, it is backing Felkin, it is backing those people who say, we have got to do something about this. They're dying very young, and you can't really carry on arguing that the pure air of heaven, in this quotation, was such that uh, it, was, it was possible for families to gamble in the fields at mealtimes. Well, the argument was, this is just nonsense. And over the, the weeks and months through the autumn of 1844 and into 1845, uh, much of this uh, becomes uh, a key issue. Dearden's map of 1844 shows just how little land there was now available in Nottingham. Uh, and down th this side of the town, on the east side, you can see the courts, the courthouses that were, that were built. And again, down here, uh, large numbers of these courts in which the very high death rates occurred. It doesn't take very long to get from there to the decision in February 1845 uh, to enclose. Uh, a small team, if you like, of important people in Nottingham, including Felkin, including Hawksley, uh, including also uh, solicitors John Wadsworth and Edwin Patchett, including the banker John Smith Wright, these, uh, these people came together, they argued the case, if the corporation won't take enclosure forward, we will, uh, and they pressed ahead with it. The, 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 the winter of 1844-5 saw enormous number of meetings, uh, it saw picketing of meetings, it saw placarding, it saw an awful lot of uh, uh, people being chased down streets and so forth uh, after council meetings and so on. But the net result of all this was that by, uh, the, that by the early February 1845, they've decided that they're going to go ahead with enclosure, and now it's a question of building into this what green spaces they're going to set out. You can see here <coughs> that uh, the, commissioners, uh, the commissioners for enclosure are going to allot various parcels of land uh, for various routes. Now, I won't go into the detail of this because uh, it, we'll hear more about it, I'm sure, during the course of the day. But by this stage, by this point in 1845, they're committed not only to enclosing the fields, but also to, uh, also to making sure that there is sufficient open space and green space for the town. Now, that's, those decisions are not part of the Enclosure Act itself. The, the Act simply defines that this is going to happen, 
And then it's a question of a small committee. Naturally, the Victorians were very keen on committees. Then it was the, the question was that a committee would be set up to work out which pieces of land, which parcels of land were going to be made available and then what they were going to do with those parcels of land when they got them. And uh, one of them, for example, there's no mention in the Act of the Arboretum, but there is very definite evidence um, by 1850 that Nottingham is determined to have an Arboretum because it doesn't like the fact that Derby has got one and they haven't. I'm sure, um, I'm sure Paul knows more about that than I do, but I, it's actually, you can actually read it in, in, in the minutes. It's all sort of in there. And so it all now goes ahead. Uh, the, the, the bill comes into Parliament in the spring of 1845. Um, we've got um, Thomas Hawksley again uh, coming forward with evidence and arguing that <clears throat> even where there is open space, it's a long way to go. You need green spaces closer to hand and so on. Um, and eventually, eventually everybody accepts that this is going to happen. And so, by uh, the summer of 1845, the decision uh, is out of the hands now of the, uh, of, of the corporation. The Act itself is given the Royal Assent on the 30th of June. Commissioners are appointed. And one of the first tasks they have is to identify the land to be set out as green spaces uh, and then to get on with, with developing it so that the, the, the walks are all finished by 1851 and, of course, the Arboretum by 1852. Um, and that all, has all come out of, the, uh, out of this legislation. Um, that's uh, essentially what uh, comes out of it, including, of course, the cemeteries that we'll also be hearing about. This has all come out of this long-running debate about uh, how the town is to be enclosed. But once it gets there, they already have these, uh, these opportunities of laying out spaces. So many other towns by the 1850s around the country are debating public parks. The big issue in the 1850s is public parks. Um, that's not really the issue in the same way here because already by the 1840s uh, they have the opportunity of putting in green lungs. Some of the other public parks that, that um, uh, Councillor Trimble referred to earlier are, of course, much later than this and are extensions out into the community which are of key importance in the longer term uh, for the way that Nottingham has subsequently developed. But there we are, Robin Hood's Chase, Corporation Oaks and the Arboretum to finish with. That's all I want to say and uh, if, if, my, if my line manager here wants to come and uh, organise the questions, over to you, Jonathan. Lovely. We've got 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. But uh, can we thank John, actually, first of all, for that? Thank you very much.